Few things strain us worse than when a loved one suffers from mental illness. Mental health issues cross every boundary, age, sex, class, race, and gender, just to name a few. What is being done today to get those suffering from mental illness the care they need, and what needs remain unaddressed by our current system? Dr. Jonathan Porteous is the CEO of WellSpace Health, and former Senate President Pro Tem Daryl Steinberg is the founder of the Steinberg Institute, a public policy institute focusing on behavioral health. In our partnership with the American Leadership Forum, they join me next on Studio Sacramento. At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. What is it about mental health issues that seem to make them so difficult to solve? I think mental health, Scott, is the unattended to issue of our time. Um, it's difficult because while we've made great advances in science and medicine and in therapies, we still don't understand uh, the causes and we know that it is an issue that oftentimes is chronic with people. A and this issue affects so many people in so many walks of life, but it also affects so many of the issues that we spend a lot of money on and we don't solve very well, whether it's criminal justice, whether it's homelessness, whether it's kids who fall behind in school and we don't understand why because they have an undiagnosed mental health condition, whether it's domestic violence or family, uh, family breakup, whole host of things. Mental health is at the root of so much of it, as is substance abuse. And so we have to come to a recognition in society that we can't be afraid to talk about it, and we must make it a top-tier public health priority. Jonathan, WellSpace has a very robust offering of mental health care services mm -hmm. that you offer throughout the region. What is it that for the, the patients that you take care of today, where is it that you all are the, are the most impacted in terms of services needed, but resources being scarce by other aspects of the healthcare environment? Well, it probably is mental health treatment. Um, we do a robust service of integrated care across primary health and behavioral health, which includes um, substance use and mental health disorders. But I think what, what Daryl was just saying is that this is a condition that is really hiding in plain sight. Um, and there are a variety of reasons why we may not want to address it. People are frightened, the stigma. Stigma. Um, it's confusing. Mm -hmm. um, and we have even um, really provide a shortage. We've got amazing treatments and not enough people often to deliver them. And, and there are some who believe that post ACA, that all of a sudden all of our problems were going to be solved. Has the ACA made a difference in the provision of mental health care treatment? I, I would say yes, actually. I, I believe that our models see an integration in primary health care. So for many people, um, for example, 33% of people coming into some of our health centers of the adults have mild to moderate depression. We screen them, we treat them in the primary care exam room with a primary care provider and a behavioral counselor who steps in. Um, this model is evidence-based uh, out of the University of Washington and um, it's shown to be as effective or more effective than referring out to a psychiatrist. Really? On the other hand, a lot of people argue that while there are the well spaces of the world, and thank God for that, that for many people, parity, mental health parity, is in name only. That it's very, very yeah. difficult to find a, a therapist or a psychiatrist. We have huge shortages, as Jonathan said, of mental health professionals, especially psychiatrists and child psychiatrists. A and there still is this great stigma. And just think about it for a moment. If a child breaks a leg, his or her classmates rally around and sign the cast. But if a child suffers from a mood disorder or depression and is out of school and comes back, nobody talks about it. That is such, that is such a great analogy. It, it's, 
it's so true that we don't rally around those who are suffering from mental illness. And you would think uh, as many decades as we've come forward in mental health care treatment, the society stigma would have gone away, but that's still not the case. Hasn't We've it? made great progress, and I think we have to acknowledge that. There is much more public awareness, and there is more of a willingness to talk about it, but the stigma still remains, and the stigma is directly related, in my view, to the continued lack of adequate funding. We passed the Mental Health Services Act, Prop 63, in 2004. It's generating $1.8 billion a year and helping thousands of people. And yet the problems, homelessness and untreated mental illness are getting worse. And so if we're ever going to convince legislatures and the Congress to fund more of what we know works, which is outreach, it's housing, and it's whatever it takes to help that person who suffers from the serious mental illness, we're going to have to tell our stories and we're going to have to demonstrate that these investments actually make a difference, that the well spaces of the world, the FQHGs, that they ought to be expanded. We ought to do more of it. Mm -hmm. But instead, it continues to be an issue that sort of is close to being on the, on the verge of being a major issue we talk about, certainly when there's gun violence. Sure but it isn't quite there yet. Well, well the let's person talk. in society, oh. you know, think about the gun violence, think about any of these issues, the child who has a mood disorder and then comes back to school. M much of what we need to learn is how to engage just as individuals, one meant to another, so to speak. Because we, even if we had a sufficiency of providers, we would still need to know how to break through that confusion and fear, really. Um, families don't know how to love their loved one. Um, friends don't know how to do love we even know how do we even know how to recognize it you know we talk about gun violence um, oftentimes the family member sees that that the individual who ends up committing the violent act was exhibiting tendencies but it, it seems like sometimes either we even as family members we shove that to the we, side we might not I don't know that these are statistically highly insignificant like very difficult to control issues like someone getting a loaded weapon and killing people. But something like schizophrenia that affects 2% of the population, yeah, in fact, there are plenty of studies that show if you take videotape footage of a child early in their life and you train lay people on what to look for in the videotapes, they will predict with a high level of accuracy someone really? who later develops schizophrenia. So we know that there are ways to look at this, but we need to just like Daryl funded so much of this sort of social stigma um, and um, social campaigning, we need to be open to communicating with people who think and act differently. Let me put it in a different way, if I might, that under the Mental Health Services Act currently, $1.8 billion a year, 20% is spent on prevention and early intervention, and 80% is spent on back-end services. What are back-end services? What I mean are services for people who have entered the criminal justice system or on the streets mm -hmm. and who have suffered a great deal before they get that kind of help. That 20, 80 percentage, we need to reverse. In 17 counties throughout California, including Sacramento at UC Davis, we are pioneering what's called early psychosis intervention and treatment where young people 14 15 years old based on family history based upon uh, their own behaviors they get the help they need earlier early and and so that as the years go on they don't suffer that inevitable first break either in their first year in college or in their early 20s which happens so often we hear this from so many people and so many families we need to do more of that. Taking uh, postvention to prevention taking reaction to proaction really we would we would be able to stop a lot of mental health conditions I from developing. I want to come back to talking about early intervention, but also how mental health issues sort of run the gamut, and they touch everything from criminal justice to uh, homelessness and, and all points in between. Do we as a society yet have we really grasped the fact that without more intervention and better treatment options and access that we're we're merely having to spend the money in other ways that ultimately don't actually move us towards solving the problem i think we know it but i think that there is a pervasive feelings especially among policymakers, that these issues are intractable 
that they're too difficult to tackle. And let's we'll, take we'll, let's take one intractable yes, issue: homelessness. Homelessness. Okay. Yes. So, give me a sense of the relationship between homelessness and mental health issues. Well, Jonathan would be more of the expert, um, and the and the studies and percentages vary. But I will tell you this. If an individual is on the streets for a long period of time, in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of most, they meet the definition of qualifying for mental health and or substance abuse ser services, and generally both. Because if you weren't mentally ill when you got to the streets, you spend a long time on the streets, and you're in need of that kind of help. And what we are lacking is a commitment to permanent supportive housing. Mm -hmm. We do all sorts of good things around temporary shelter and sustenance for people and we're beginning to address <clears throat> the medical needs of people and even the mental health services are better than they were. But unless and until we have a community and a state strategy that says housing first, we're not going to end the cycle for a lot of people and I think there's a way to do that. So that, that's kind of interesting to hear, Jonathan, because most people most people would reflexively say it's treatment first, not housing first. As a clinician yourself, how does that strike you? Well, firstly, we've had this massive issue of trans institutionalization. Historically, we had trans institutionalization. What does that mean? It means that we had a population that historically were in mental health asylums. And when those were depopulated, they trans institutionalized. They went to correctional facilities and they went to homeless camps. Um, and so we, we had a whole population of people with mental illness and sort of a spectator sport approach to watching them moving around to the next institution, which for many was, was homelessness. Being, um, having a mental health condition is sometimes even adaptive when you're homeless. Uh, people who wear a, a thick coat in the summertime um, tend to give off an odor and tend to push people away. That really helps when you're really paranoid about others. So if you can engage someone and put them into a housing context where you're simply providing them with a safe place, it may take months or even years for them to become comfortable living in that place, but that really is the first step. And housing first says, go there. Don't judge the mental health condition. Don't judge the substance use. Provide the shelter. Provide homefulness. It is a vital sign. Um, and provide them with the space where they can then learn to trust and provide supportive services in that context. If you go to Martin Luther King Village here in Sacramento, if you go to Boulevard Court, um, the mutual housing in the Highlands, you will find people who first had a home and they had services co-located and over time they've engaged in those services. And that is a is, is sort of a radical and wonderful solution. It's much more effective. But but the only way to get there, it would seem, is you have to rob treatment services in order to create housing. What, how would you? No. 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 Well, let, let me give you an example. This I keep talking about this 1.8 billion dollars. It's a lot of money for services. It's not nearly enough because the need is greater. But here's what I think we ought to do. One of the flaws in the way we fund government services, especially in mental health, is that while the counties are the main providers and do a great job working with nonprofits in the community, we distribute this $1.8 billion 58 ways. And it's hard to have a statewide impact, and it's hard to capitalize on that money when you're distributing it so widely. I think we should take 7% off the top of that $1.8 billion. I think we ought to dedicate it for 30 years. I think we ought to bond against it. And we ought to create a capital fund of $2 billion for permanent supportive housing. And we ought to leverage it three or four to one with tax credits and other uh, kinds of public and private subsidies. And we ought to make the most conservative effort we have ever made in this state to combat homelessness, especially among the mentally ill. We can do that without raising a dime of additional money. It's just thinking smarter about the resources that we have. Because if we don't demonstrate that we can make a dent in the most visible manifestation of untreated mental illness, homelessness, 
it's going to be hard to rally the people to say we ought to do more for more people and that ought to be our goal. So the 7% would be dedicated specifically to supportive housing for homelessness or or would it be broad it could based? Be, it could be broader so long as it went towards helping those living with serious mental illness. It can be for those who are at the risk of being homeless mm -hmm. or who are Mm -hmm. Couch surfing. Well, and, and the reason that I raise it is because mental illness and the need for wraparound services runs the gamut. You know, there are teens that have issues. We have, you know, adults. I mean, it, 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 as, as we said in the opening, this problem, you know, crosses every single aspect of Two society. Two billion dollars could go a long way to meeting the needs of a lot of populations who are living with these issues who were, were housing, where the lack of housing is at the core, and where you can't help them on the service side unless they're living in a stable well, and safe firstly, place. you can't engage them easily. But, but really, more importantly, um, housing brings down acuity. Like someone who is homeless is more likely to use, they're more likely to live in fear, um, to, to feel like they're being persecuted, to actually be persecuted. We know that what you bring up, someone shooting someone, a person with mental illness is far more likely to be the victim of a crime than the perpetrator of a crime. Really? And far more likely, because they're easy to pick on. And for many, um, they already have an experience of persecution because they're dealing with internal stimuli. Put them in a safe place. Your investment um, has massive cascading consequences on the lives of many people which really from the bottom line perspective have a, a huge savings in mental health treatment. And people are in a, a safe, predictable place. We actually have exam rooms built into these housing environments where someone who has not engaged in health care, not engaged in, in mental health care, can actually see clinicians, can get medication, and over time it becomes a part of their life as opposed to this episodic and, um, and chaotic a treatment approach that happens when you're living on the American River. Let, let me turn the discussion to uh, uh, another point on the mental health care spectrum, and that is for every person who is suffering from acute mental illness, there is typically some loved one, a family friend, someone who is desperately concerned about that individual mm -hmm. and uh, tends to tends to struggle, at least at first, mm -hmm. in getting that person hooked into services. What is it, where are we at right now as a region in being able to provide more coordinated care to those who are seeking to make sure that their loved one who is suffering from a mental illness can get care as quickly as possible? Well, firstly, with, with a lot of the um, innovative legislative funding um, that Daryl was involved with. We are seeing more mental health navigators in the places where people are a showing mental up. health navigator. Someone who's in an ex emergency room, for example, and someone's coming in for episodic, um, sort of random um, treatment um, for a health or mental health condition, who is then engaged and navigated into the appreciate context. And that's very reassuring for families that don't Do you know. have to go to an ER in order to find one of these navigators? No, not necessarily. They are on the street. There are navigators downtown here in Sacramento who will int introduce themselves to people and encourage them into services. We have navigation out on the streets as well at Wellspace Health. We have people in the hospitals. We, d we help people discharge um, and do sort of what we call care transition. But what we're trying to do is make sure that one, someone has a skilled professional helping them, not just a family member, um, and they're going to the right place for the right care at the right time, as opposed to extreme settings or no settings, which again is often in this community, the river or the emergency room. Hmm. But for the family member, say who's not on the street or at risk of being out on the street, I think we are improving our system with the help and cooperation of the hospitals, for example, in the Sacramento region have done a great job, Valley Vision and others, to create alternatives to emergency room care and to, and to build this navigation system that Jonathan described. But we want to go back even further than that, I think, because we don't want 
to have situations where the only time somebody can get help of any kind is when they're in crisis. What about before the crisis? It begs the question, how does somebody who is feeling badly or living with a biochemical illness, how do they use their insurance coverage? How do they use the ACA? How do we build up the network of providers so that somebody can get help early in the, the, the origin or, or the direction of their particular illness before they hit that crisis point? And we're not quite there yet. Parity in, in action, not just in words, mm -hmm. is a big part of that. You've mentioned that twice. Yes. Uh, on what basis do you believe that parity still doesn't exist? I'll give you one great example. If somebody has a heart attack and you call 911, family member calls 911, they're rushed to the emergency room, and if they need surgery or they need three or four days of, of care, there's a hospital bed for them. California, if someone is in mental health crisis and brought in on a so-called 5150, often by the police, mm -hmm. more times than not, there's not a hospital bed. That's the lack of institutional parity. It's also true on the insurance side. There's still huge struggles, even though the law says that you can't treat a mental health condition different from a physical health condition. In reality, it's hard to get the number of therapy visits that you might need for the help that you need. It's hard to find a provider. Mm -hmm. Even if you find a provider, sometimes it's so difficult to deal with the insurance company that they demand you know, cash pay up front. And so we haven't achieved the, the situation that we want to achieve, which is that you walk through no wrong door, either while in crisis or before in crisis, to get the help that you need. That, I, I would say we should have great optimism about healthcare reform. But when it comes to mental health treatment, not only is it lacking in parity, but it's still siloed. There are still services for people who are chronically mentally ill or, or very mentally ill, um, and then services for people with lesser mental health conditions or less severe symptoms. And there's not a true continuum of care. It's typically, you know, you get services in one place for one um, level of intensity. And then once you reached a certain other level of intensity, suddenly you are moved to a completely different silo. And so one of the things we need to do is build really a seamless continuum of care. I, I want to ask you about that. So over the past 20 years or so, th there was a term coined the medicalization of mental health, meaning that there were all of these pharma pharmaceutical agents that were created, which um, you know had dramatic impacts on people in terms of being able to stabilize people, for instance, suffering from schizophrenia, conditions like that. But in the, the, this discovery, what also happened was is that from a payer perspective, it became far cheaper to send someone to a prescriber and to give them a pill mm -hmm. than to engage in more exhaustive, more complicated processes like talk therapy and these other interventions that you discussed earlier. Where are we at today in terms of not just, because you're talking about silos, not just access to mental health care, but not being driven to the lowest common do denominator solution? Well, you know, many mental health conditions, it's very clear that um, they are treated better with both psychotherapy and pharmacology. So all the data, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of very solid empirical evidence to show that moderate depression, for example, is most effectively treated with a combination of psychotherapy and medicine. Um, both are strong by themselves, but the two together are the strongest. Uh, there's even data now that show that sort of long-term analytic um, couch-based therapies are effective with people with schizophrenia, but really? it's, it's quite remarkable. There, there have been meta-analytic studies that show that. Would one want to do that and take 10 years to help someone when you have incredible um, next-generation pharmacologic agents? No, but would one deny the relationship that someone needs 
to reconnect with society and the, the, the skills that they need to learn to reconnect with society, that's, you know, then they're not going to do it as well with just the pharmacology. Um, people who have been persecuted for a long time internally have to learn how to reconnect with society. Families need to also be brought in. If you look at clinical models for people with chronic conditions, family therapy is actually indicated across time, especially when someone starts to, to get better, because that's when they need to re-engage with you know, the, 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 the family unit or the, the familial unit, whether it's true kin or others. And we don't, we don't see that enough. If you go to Britain and you look at the, the evidence-based models that are required by the government, they, they require family therapy. We see the Alliance for the Mentally Ill stepping in, Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance doing great work. But and we're going to have to leave it there. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Scott. And that's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. Five Star Bank community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.